Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, good afternoon friends, so let us try to take up uh, a very significant issue uh, which is basically uh, related to the introductory rural sociology. I think all of us are into the understanding of rural sociology in terms of uh, rural society in terms of its dynamics and uh, basically we try to see that how we are going to link up with the contemporary issue and that way I think uh, we try to see that uh, <coughs> we have to speak about uh, the issue of concern uh, which is going in and around the world uh, with which we are living basically in unit fourth uh, that is changing against structure and rural development concerns in rural society. Uh, the most important issue which has to be dealt with is the issue of globalization. So, <coughs> the 20th chapter uh, that is on globalization and agriculture. I think uh, this is going to be the most updated uh, because uh, this is the phenomenon which is going to be with us in and around. So, this chapter is going to introduce you with the issues of globalization and its implication on agriculture. I think that of course, is going to be important. It will reflect upon the issues related to the food security, global agribusiness and also the associated issues of the WTO. IPR or the GATT. I think these are the popular uh, notions which are attached with uh, the whole issue of uh, the globalization. So, I think uh, uh, beyond that I think uh, the most important thing that we have to really learn when we try to speak about the globalization is that we have to speak, speak about the issue of economic liberalization in India because I think uh, that is seen as a turning point in terms of bringing about social transformation in the uh, nation in general and in the uh, rural society in particular and that way we try to see that the advent of great economic liberalization in India has basically paved the way for uh, the new sort of agrarian setting and also it has enhanced to a, a greater concern uh, the whole issue of uh, uh, coming of the new players into the countryside. And that is where we try to see things in terms of the implications of globalization on the rural society. Now, I think uh, uh, to be uh, to just frame the things, uh, we can see that uh, since independence, we try to follow the mixed framework, which we try to see in the form of uh, the socialistic path. Sometimes we try to see the mixed form of uh, mixed path, which include the public and the private, <coughs> and uh, we try to see gradually we have uh, moved towards uh, the new. Uh, aspect of uh, the liberalization and we try to see that uh, uh, this is basically seen as uh, the advent of the new uh, generation or the new form of uh, change uh, which has taken place in the countryside. In 1991 uh, basically India has met with the economic crisis and relating it uh, to the external depth. The government was not able to make repayment on the borrowing from the abroad especially the foreign exchange reserves and the crisis has further compounded by the rising prices of the essential goods. So, all these has led to the new set of policy measures uh, which has changed the direction of the of our developmental strategies. Therefore, the policy of liberation was introduced uh, which was seen as an end to these restrictions and open up the various sectors of the economy. Though uh, a few liberalization measures are being adopted in 1980s in the area of industrial licensing, export import policies, technology upgradation or the fiscal policies and the for foreign investment. But beyond that we also try to see that the reform policies were initiated in 1991 uh, which are to be seen in terms of uh, removal of the various barriers and the process of globalization was initiated in 1991 uh, which was seen as having its spread in terms of roots and branches and now we try to experience its implications. Uh, many of us are basically trying to see that uh, <coughs> there are different 
sectors in which we can have the implications of uh, uh, so called <coughs> globalization. One of the most striking feature of economic development in the is the relative decline of in the agricultural sector in the growing economies. I think that is the visible force of change which we try to see. Also, uh, we also see the average population density is uh, in a decline with regard to the agricultural comparative advantages as well as the capital accumulation and the industrialization processes. Also, we try to see that export led boom in is another sector in which we try to see uh, there is a sudden change and we basically try to see that uh, there is also a decline or uh, uh, in terms of the food self sufficiency and also the issue of net export of the total agricultural product has been enhanced. And basically we try to see that uh, the agriculture trade has been in acceleration because of globalization over the past quarter centuries and that has been characterized by the rapid decline in the cost of cross border trades in the farms and the other produ uh, products uh, which has basically led to even the introduction of the ICT information communication technology as a major uh, tool of change uh, with regard to the agricultural trade. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, which we try to see are the background players which has basically led to the advent of globalization in the countryside and uh, we try to see by globalization uh, which basically refers to an increase in the movement of finance inputs, outputs, information and science across the vast geographies, geographical areas. The gain from globalization increases the net income in many places and facilitate the decrease in the level of poverty and may thereby increase the level of food security. So, globalization can greatly enhance the role of agriculture as an engine of growth in the low income countries by making it possible for agriculture to grow considerably faster than the domestic consumption. It also increases the potential for agriculture to the increased food security uh, through the enlarged multipliers, multipliers to the massive employment intensive non tradable uh, rural non farm sectors also. And I think uh, that is where we try to see the advantages of uh, the globalization. The three features which characterize the competing uh, in terms of the current globalization context are the cost reduction in one place has immediate impact in other places especially when we try to speak about the agricultural price. I think the cost reduction and associated production increases constantly across in the agriculture. And uh, this is basically because of the force of globalization that we try to see. Uh, second important thing is the cost reduction largely derives from the technological advances. That is another important issue whereby the technologies are being introduced in the countryside and that is basically leading to certain amount of changes with regard to the production. And with that there is a reduced cost and the price has declined uh, in general, uh, especially when we try to speak about uh, uh, certain uh, Asian countries and the African countries, we try to see uh, these particular issues. And thirdly, we try to see that the WTO rules constraints, the extent to which the countries can protect themselves. Uh, basically, we are trying to speak about the WTO works to reduce the trade barriers and to enforce the agreed rules and this has basically created uh, because of the process of globalization and we try to find out that uh, the protectionist measure of the past are being allowed to continue in the high income countries. Uh, this is also happening with regard to the globalization. So, virtually what is required uh, for the low income countries to benefit from the globalization because as we have seen that globalization is not going to be uh, putting the different countries as the equal players. So, what is required at the end of the low income countries to get the benefits from the globalization are that is opening the economy to the trade and market force. I think this is the first requirement uh, uh, which the so called uh, 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 <coughs> developing countries have to do the ben to benefit uh, the benefit of globalization. Uh, flows from the trade. So, the export requires the import, but trade restrictions tend to drive up the cost of exports. So, what is required is opening the economy to the trade and the market forces that is going to be an important issue. And also we have to see investing in the agricultural research and dissemination, uh, which we try to see in terms of uh, giving more impetus to the agriculture 
uh, research in terms of productivity in terms of the new innovations uh, which we can speak about. So, the low income countries need to invest far more than at the present in the agricultural research and technological uh, dissemination and without such investment the opening market will do a little for the agriculture and hence they will have the issue of poverty and the food security. So, in order to overcome that I think agricultural research and dissemination is going to be an important issue uh, which they have to focus upon. The third thing is investing in the rural infrastructure. Uh, it basically involves uh, that uh, the rural infrastructures in the uh, low income countries are seen to be in a uh, condition of a uh, uh, condition which is not very favorable for them. So, we what is required is that massive investment are needed uh, basically in the rural infra in terms of rural infrastructure especially we try to speak about the issues related to insurance, crop insurance, irrigation, storage, uh, the use of uh, uh, what you can say the marketability in terms of transport and communication. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, which we have to do uh, in order to make it uh, quite uh, efficient uh, so that they can have the benefits of uh, the globalization. And also we have to see that facilitating the private sector actively. I think this is the fourth requirement uh, which the low income countries have to manage uh, because uh, the public sector by their own uh, are not going to be seen as uh, uh, putting up uh, uh, much uh, needs. And that way I think uh, when the private sectors are uh, coming into the picture, so uh, especially in the field of export, uh, their uh, role is going to be quite significant because they are away from the bureaucratic constraints. So, that way they can uh, give the better results uh, when we try to see in terms of uh, the development of trade. So, virtually we try to see that uh, these are the sort of preconditions uh, uh, which one can say uh, are required which the low income countries they have to do in order to make them uh, more efficient. But I think as I have said earlier also that globalization definitely has to be seen uh, from various phases because uh, as I said that all the countries are not to be seen as the equal players. So, what is required is that uh, they have to basically uh, 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 see how uh, we can have the different countries having the different positions because all of them are not at the equal footing and that way we can say that uh, globalization has both the sides. It has the positive consequences and it also has the negative consequences uh, with regard to the Indian agriculture. So, in order to have the wider understanding about the globalization on Indian agriculture, let us try to see the positive consequences of globalization on the Indian agriculture. The first important thing that we try to see that may happen uh, because of uh, the globalization is the availability of the modern agro technologies. I think uh, there is the availability of the modern agro technologies in the form of pesticides, herbicides and fertilizers as well as the new breeds of high yield crops uh, which are to be employed to increase the food production. And these technologies included the modern implementation in the form of uh, irrigation projects, pesticides, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers and the improved crop varieties developed through the conventional science based methods. Uh, that is going to be high. So, virtually we try to see that the use of high yielding varieties uh, are going to be an important issue and uh, high yielding variety significantly uh, outperform the traditional varieties in the presence of adequate edu uh, irrigation pesticides and fertilizers. So, that way I think uh, they are going to be quite significant. Second important uh, consequences uh, which we have to see is the rise in production and productivity. So, due to adoption of the high yield variety technology, the production of the food grains increased considerably in the country. The production of wheat has increased from 8.8 .8 million tons in 1965 to 184 million tons in 1991-92. So, the productivity of other food grains has also increased considerably. So, we can see that uh, it is 71 percent in the case of cereals, 104 percent for the wheat, 52 percent for the paddy uh, which has been seen from the period 1965-66 to the period 1989-90. So, one can see that uh, there is a high yielding production which has occurred because of the green revolution. The food green production has increased drastically 
and we can say that uh, uh, it has a, a significant influence on the countryside. Thirdly, uh, we can see that the growth of the national income has been enhanced. Uh, we can say that uh, uh, the international market for the agriculture goods of India uh, where we try to find out that the new technology, the new seeds, the new agricultural practices, they have helped to grow the agricultural products. And from the monetary point of view, we can say that the agriculture sector in the economy is raised to 14.2 percent of the GDP in 2010-11. So, that way I think uh, the, the, the production in terms of uh, uh, the so called uh, growth of national income has drastically increased. And also we try to see another significant thing uh, which we can see as a positive consequences is the new area employment. I think uh, the new area employment uh, which definitely uh, we cannot locate exactly in the field of countryside, but what we can say of course is that uh, the exporting of the agricultural product necessarily put the uh, products in terms of standardization, in terms of processing, in terms of packaging. Therefore, the different uh, industries uh, basically which are related to agriculture, uh, they can generate the new employment in the various sectors like packing, exporting, standardizing, processing, transporting or cold storages, all these facilities can be generated in the countryside and the industries depending upon the agriculture are to be stored and it is made uh, to increase the employment. So, that way I think if you try to see that uh, the unorganized labor force can be put into the standardized forms uh, through this particular initiative. So, the share of agriculture in the total employment can be enhanced drastically. And then we can also speak about the issue of agriculture as a prime moving force uh, because agriculture always has been the backstage uh, has been the backbone of the Indian economy uh, through history. But in order to make it as uh, the prime moving force, uh, we have to see that how we can enhance the agriculture sector and basically we try to see that uh, especially with the advent of the LPG that is the liberalization, privatization and globalization. The agriculture uh, sector in India has been developing drastically and we try to see as per the uh, World Trade Organization data, the global export and the import of agriculture and the food products in 2011 stood to around 1.66 trillion dollars and to 1.82 uh, tr <coughs> trillion dollars uh, in the country and India's share in that is 2.07 percent and 1.2 uh, 4 percent respectively. So, we can say that uh, uh, we can contribute significantly towards the world economy and also we try to see that there is another important possibility that is rise in the share in the trade. And because of the conditions of WTO, uh, we try to see that export of the agriculture product is going to be high and according to the World Bank data, we can say that uh, uh, India's share has increased from 0 0.54 percent in 1990 to 0. 6, 7 percent uh, within 5 years after globalization that is in 1999. So, that way the Indian export export has rise from uh, to 103 percent uh, uh, during that particular period. So, that is how we try to see that it can enhance uh, the things and also we try to see that there is also the growth of agro exports uh, which is again going to be a very significant thing. Basically, we try to see that agricultural products uh, which accounts for 10.23 percent of the total export income of the economy, uh, while the agricultural imports uh, accounts for just 2.74 percent of the total imports. And that is how we try to see that agriculture exports uh, has to be enhanced uh, that is going to be very significant. And finally, I think uh, the most important issue on which everybody tries to eye upon is the issue of poverty. So, I think uh, with the uh, as one of the positive marker of globalization, we can also uh, help in terms of reduction in the poverty. So, we can see that uh, the true uh, sense of globalization can be characterized as increasing uh, the gap between the rich and the poor, but we try to see that the poverty in general uh, in the relative terms is also going to be drastically different and we try to see that the percentage of the people below poverty line has been decreasing progressively from 36 percent in 1993-94 to 21.9 percent in 2011 and 12. So, that way I think uh, we try to see that the reduction in poverty has been there. 
So, I think uh, these are certain positive components uh, which we try to see can be related to the Indian agriculture uh, because of the globalization. So, these are the, uh, the brighter side of the stories uh, which can be associated with the uh, agriculture of uh, uh, because of globalization. But I think uh, as I said that globalization alone, globalization cannot always have the uh, positive implications. Definitely it has some negative consequences in terms of uh, the Indian agriculture. So, what are the negative in, uh, uh, consequences of uh, globalization on Indian agriculture? I think that is also going to be significant, especially the first important thing that is going to be uh, the, the, the question of attraction for many will be that uh, the issue of the vicious depth trap and the farmer suicide. I think this is going to be an important issue that uh, we need to examine that uh, uh, because of the agriculture growth in the agriculture sector, it also has resulted into uh, basically the issue of farmer suicide like Andhra Pradesh uh, which has uh, shown a certain amount of uh, reforms in terms of uh, the agreement with the World Bank and uh, uh, having a huge number of loans and with that what, what has happened of course is that uh, in terms of uh, uh, the production uh, we try to find out that because of the World Bank uh, policies uh, we, we have joined with them but the rate of farmer suicide in the state has also grown up. So, what should we try to see that uh, the National Sur Sample Survey Organization uh, report of 2005 indicates that 1 to 2 percent farm households are in debt and only 10 percent of the debt is incurred from the non-production purposes. And also we try to see as per the National Crime Record Bureau reports between 1997 to 2005, we try to find out the significant number of farmer committed suicide. Uh, in terms of number it is uh, 156562. So, virtually we try to see that a uh, huge number uh, are been uh, seen with regard to uh, the farmer suicide. So, we try to see that more than 20 percent of the suicides have taken place in the Karnataka alone and that basically is seen as an outcome of uh, the issue of globalization and liberalization. Uh, second important issue that uh, has to be addressed with regard to the issue of globalization in terms of the negative consequences is the migration of labor. I think uh, migration of labor is another significant issue which has to be addressed. Basically, we try to see that the Indian farmers uh, who are uh, been seen as uh, uh, having uh, sometimes the low productivity and uh, because of uh, uh, the <coughs> lacunas which has been there in the countrysides. So, the migration uh, tendencies are going to be high especially to move from agriculture to the non-agricultural sectors. So, we try to see that the domestic farmers uh, could not stand uh, with the competitiveness of the international market and which has resulted into the migration of labor from agriculture to the industrial activities. So, this is going to be an important shift which has taken place. And also we try to see that uh, the lower income of the rural farmers uh, uh, has also been visible especially when we try to uh, as has been pointed out by Joseph Stiglitz uh, with regard to uh, who was an economist and uh, to him the trade agreement has now forbidden uh, the most subsidies accepted for the agricultural goods. And this depresses the income of those farmers in the developing countries who do not get the subsidies. And since these subsidies are been declined, so we try to see that uh, it has basically uh, affected uh, the, the living standards of the rural farmers. So, virtually we try to see that is another important thing which has happened. Also, we try to see that uh, there is a lessening of the international competitiveness uh, which are occurring because of uh, the globalization. Like in India, 60 percent of the population depends on agriculture and this pressure on agriculture is increasing day by day because of the increasing population. We try to find out that uh, the curtailment in the subsidies and the grants has weakened the agricultural sectors and on the contrary the reduction in the grants by the WTO in the developed countries has disturbed the grants on the large scale. So, virtually we try to see that uh, there are new difficulties which are coming up basically lessening of the international competitiveness is coming up and the farmers are not in a position to compete with the international market. So, I think uh, earlier they were struggling for having competition within themselves, but now their competition is with the outside forces also in term, uh, with the outside uh, uh, Borgias in terms of uh, the industrial industrialist. So, how they are going to compete with them that is the new pressure and the new force which is coming up. 
And also we try to see another significant uh, uh, negative consequences is in the form of the abnormal hike in the fertilizer and the pesticide price. So, immediately after globalization, the Indian rupee has been devalued by 25 percent and the Indian crops became very cheap and attractive in the global market, uh, which has led the Indian farmer for export and encouraged them to shift from the growing a uh, mixture of traditional crops to the export oriented cash crops. And they are now into production of chili, cotton and tobacco, uh, which are seen as the cash crops. So, uh, these needs has basically uh, led to the overuse of pesticides, fertilizers and water and this has basically led them uh, to basically uh, have some dependency on uh, these particular issues for more production. And we try to see that uh, the investment in fertilizer and pesticides in terms of the agricultural inputs that has grown high and that has also been uh, made them more vulnerable. And then also uh, we try to see the issue of electricity tariff uh, which has also drastically increased. Uh, in, uh, we try to see that pre-liberalization uh, subsidies, uh, subsidized agri uh, electricity policies has helped the farmers drastically and the electric cost was increased drastically when the farmers turned their cultivation to the cash crops. And with that what has happened of course is that the payment in terms of uh, the irrigation the high consumption of electricity that has basically made them more vulnerable. And we try to see that Andhra Pradesh uh, being the traditionally the drought prone area, uh, we try to see that uh, uh, there has been an increase uh, 5 times between 1998 to 2003 in terms of uh, the electricity tariff. So, this has basically led to uh, make uh, uh, the uh, rural countryside in Andhra Pradesh more vulnerable, uh, especially when the price of the uh, electricity tariff has been raised high. And also we try to see that the issue of price crash is a common phenomenon which is happening uh, with the uh, advent of globalization. Uh, uh, like we try to see that uh, many times uh, the price of the uh, prop, uh, crop which has been produced, uh, the investment in terms of agriculture input has been high. But we try to find out that uh, the cheap import flooded with the market pushing prices of the co crops like cotton and pepper that has gone down. And with that what has happened of course is that the input price uh, is more and the uh, output price is less. And with that what has happened of course is that they are in the in-depth situation and they are not in a position to get the profit. So, virtually the farmers are committing the suicide especially uh, this is quite visible when we try to speak about the state of Maharashtra. Uh, which has the higher concentration of cotton belt and also in other parts we try to see that uh, the issue of uh, uh, fluctuation in the price has really affected the lives of the farmers. And also we try to see that in general we have fall in the agricultural employment uh, which is a common uh, culture which has happened and globalization definitely has uh, paved the way for this like in, in 1951 agriculture provided employment to 72 percent of the population and contributed 59 percent of the gross uh, domestic product. However, in 2001 the population depending upon the agriculture is only 58 percent roughly whereas the share of agriculture in the GDP has went down drastically to 24 percent. And we try to see that this ratio is going to be uh, lowering down further. So, I think uh, somewhere we try to see that. Uh, uh, the uh, the <coughs> composition of uh, uh, the workforce uh, in terms of agriculture pr productivity has been drastically down and that is basically seen as uh, one important issue which is creating the problem. Uh, we also try to see that uh, in the era of globalization uh, most of the first world countries in order to remain globally competitive they are been pursuing the path of econom economic liberalization uh, partial or the full privatization of the government institutions and the assets and also the greater labor market flexibility. And that is basically leading to the new changing uh, equations with regard to the global market. And we try to see that these forces are basically bringing the new changes uh, in those countries where uh, the things have not been disturbed. So, I think uh, somewhere we try to see that the change at one place is going to influence the whole of the world. Uh, that is becoming a common norm. And we try to see that economic liberalization which was basically seen as 
uh, and adjustment policies introduced in the developing countries uh, in 1970s. And uh, I think uh, the whole notion was with regard to the non-interventionist approach of the government uh, that has taken place and uh, more investment on the private uh, was also been introduced. But we try to see that uh, uh, somewhere we try to see that uh, the welfare oriented approach of the state is gradually reducing and it is more economic welfare or the <coughs> what you can say the concern for the profit uh, that is coming up and that is basically creating uh, more dangers in the life of the people who are in the countryside because they are not the competitors who can fight with the international institutions, with the international bodies and <coughs> that is where we try to see that uh, these issues are going to be more drastic. I think uh, when we try to talk specifically about the economic liberalization in India, uh, we try to find out that uh, it was a structural adjustment program uh, that is called as SAP uh, which was introduced in, the, in 1991 it was seen as the policy of globalization uh, which can be seen concretely which was introduced in India. And we try to see that uh, initially there were lot many resistance uh, the government of P. V. Narasimha Rao uh, and the <coughs> that then prime finance minister uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, had uh, brought about the breakthrough reforms uh, basically uh, trying to have the new <coughs> economic policies the new liberal policies which were been included, opening of the international trades and investment, deregulations, initiation of privatization, tax reforms, inflation control measures, all these things have been invented at that period of time. So, the reforms of uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, structural adjustment program gradually marked by the advent of uh, the 1981, 1991 reforms. I think uh, are going to bring about the substantive changes with regard to the economy of uh, the Indian society. And basically we try to see that the economic reforms has to some extent also led to certain amount of agrarian crisis uh, which are quite visible especially when we try to speak about uh, the new social formations which are taking place. We try to find out that uh, the rural India uh, which is basically seen as having the backward social formations facing the numerous. Uh, developmental related problems, the issue of landlessness, the lack of resources, poverty, indebtedness, the lack of educational facilities, illiteracy, malnourishment, poor conditions of health and sanitation. I think these are the, uh, the, the uh, pre markers of the Indian society in the pre economic reform phase. But uh, as we try to see the development took place, uh, we try to find out that uh, in many uh, aspects uh, the things have been improved. But uh, in terms of infrastructure development still uh, we are not coming in pace with the global standards and that is where we try to find out that uh, the issues which have been generated uh, by the globalization uh, that is not going to be very competitive when we try to see the Indian countryside. Like if we try to see the economic reforms which has promised for the agrarian sector uh, in the competitive sense especially we are trying to speak about the uh, deregulating agricultural credits, contract farming raising the land ceilings or putting the land reforms into practices. I think these programs which has been initiated uh, they had a positive implications on the rural lives. But when we try to speak about the uh, private sectors agricultural research or the contribution of the uh, non-governmental agencies I think uh, that is not going to be very fruitful when we try to speak about the issue of uh, uh, the rural India and that way I think uh, uh, there are certain problems which are emerging. Uh, as has been pointed out by Gorang Sai that in the era of postmodernity, uh, uh, the policy of liberal, liberalization, privatization and globalization has become a lifeline of economy of all the countries. And uh, uh, in his work uh, that was in 2010, uh, he was trying to speak about certain issues uh, whereby the global village how they are going to be seen in terms of uh, uh, the new changes. We try to see that uh, there is an increasing landlessness and inequality uh, in land holdings uh, which has occurred. And uh, this is basically seen as one important uh, characteristics uh, uh, which has been marked when we try to speak about the contribution of uh, the globalization that there is an increasing landlessness and inequality in land holding which has emerged. Uh, basically the people who started moving uh, towards uh, the high value and the export uh, oriented cash crops that has altered the uh, what you can say the subsistence economy and the cropping patterns has suddenly changed 
and to some extent it has basically led to uh, the transformation in terms of scale. Uh, so, there is a scale change in the scale in agriculture uh, which can be pointed out and we can say that uh, the small farmers and uh, uh, the people who are not competitive they could not cope up uh, with these drastic changes and uh, somehow they were trying to struggle uh, with regard to the state and the private players. Uh, another important thing which we can just see is the declining pro productivity in agriculture and the increasing marginalization of the peasantry. I think that was another important thing uh, which we try to see has emerged. Uh, I think globalization uh, which is basically is been seen as uh, uh, related with the issue of privatization uh, which has drastically affected the peasantry uh, who were considered to be the substance based uh, producers. Now, uh, we try to see that uh, peasantry in the face of uh, the globalization has ultimately led to uh, led them to be in a more vulnerable situation. And basically we try to see that the productivity through time has also decreased uh, because uh, we try to find out that the marginal holdings land holdings are not going to be very ripe in terms of production. The land reforms which has been introduced are uh, now the new uh, policies are not going to be very vi viable in terms of uh, bringing about changes in the land reforms. And with that uh, we try to find out that there is an increasing number of marginal farmers uh, from 39.1% in 1960 61 to 71% in 2003 so that way i think uh, the category of farmers uh, which operated on the total land that has also been drastically changed so virtually we try to find out that uh, the marginal farmers uh, through time has uh, been more and that way i think uh, there is a decline in the productivity and uh, investment in the agriculture we also try to see another significant change uh, which we try to see in the form of changing cropping patterns and diminishing food security status. And we try to find out that uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, revolutionary changes uh, which has basically taken place. And we try to speak about the issues which are related to the devaluation of the rupee at the market uh, in the international market that is going to be an important issue. The cash crops of cotton and the sugar cane which has increased drastically by 25 percent to 10 percent uh, has also been visible and we try to see that uh, the changing cropping pattern has also led to certain amount of uh, changes uh, basically we try to see that structural crisis in the agri Indian agriculture has taken place uh, shift has been from cereals to high value products like the fruits, vegetables, milk protein uh, products, meat, eggs and the other things. So, I think uh, that has also been an outcome of the new forces of liberalization uh, which has been introduced. And then also we try to see that declining growth of growth rates of agriculture uh, which is basically seen as an important issue. Basically we try to find out that uh, <coughs> the diminishing production of food grains uh, is happening along with the declining growth rate of agriculture in the post reform period. And the growth rate of agriculture by gross product uh, fell from 3.08 percent during 1980-81 to 1991. So, I think uh, uh, this is the drastic change uh, which is quite visible and it has reduced to 2.57 percent during 1992-93. So, we try to see that uh, there is a declining rate of agriculture uh, which is also happening which has been pointed out by uh, a scholar like Pozani in 2002. And then we try to see the diminishing profitability of agriculture uh, which is seen as a common phenomenon. People are moving away from the agricultural practices uh, seeing it not as a profitable uh, economy. And also we try to see that uh, parallelly we have the reduction of the input subsidies uh, which is quite a visible phenomenon. The government has uh, basically uh, reduced the subsidies uh, which are to be seen in terms of uh, uh, the production. We try to find out that uh, uh, the green revolution uh, which was basically trying to support with some subsidies, but with the advent of the new uh, economic policies uh, there is a drastic shift which has happened and the people uh, the, the government has uh, lesser attention towards the subsidy on electricity in terms of subsidy on fertilizers and irrigation uh, which has drastically fallen down uh, after the late 1990s. And we try to see that it has definitely affected the life of the peasantry in general and of the countryside uh, uh, agriculturalist in particular. And also 
we try to see that there is a decline in the public investment in the agricultural research and extension in irrigation uh, that is also seen as an important uh, uh, issue which is coming up drastically. And along with that, I think uh, we also try to see that there is a decline uh, in the social and the developing bankings and the return of the money lenders is coming up uh, in a new way. And also the output side of the agriculture is basically full of uncertainty and risk. I think this is what uh, has been uh, visible as a common phenomenon, especially when we try to see the contribution of Pozani, uh, who was trying to see that the risk associated with the output side of the agriculture has acquired the new dimension in the post 1990s, uh, which are detrimental to the farmers. Especially referring to the official data, uh, Pozani argues that to the conventional yield, the shock associated with the uh, dearth of water have been added shocks resulting from the spurious seeds and adulterated pesticides from unregulated private dealers and the resulting crop failures have become been one of the major factors pushing the farming into the indebtedness. So, I think uh, this is where we try to see uh, the sort of uh, uh, the tyranny which is emerging because of the uh, globalization. Uh, following the India's accession to WTO, we try to see that uh, many composite uh, issues are coming up, especially we try to see the issue of uh, uh, what uh, Pozani writes, the import duty on cotton uh, for instance was reduced to almost 0, uh, leading to the sharp uh, decline in the price of cotton, uh, which has been the crop of choice for many farmers in Andhra Pradesh. So, I think somewhere we try to see that uh, because of the shift in the policy of the government and also the advent of the private players in terms of uh, the WTO trying to have their own combinations with regard to the price of the uh, produce that has basically uh, changed the whole uh, game with regard to what has to be produced. Uh, so, the peoples are basically forced to produce those crops uh, which are the need of the hour. So, basically in spite of moving towards their own choice of crops, they are now shifting towards the crop which is basically meant for the market and that is where we try to see the whole issue is going to be more uh, <coughs> difficult. And as I said earlier also that the agrarian crisis and the farmer suicide uh, which we have discussed in the uh, <coughs> previous chapter also that how farmer suicide has been at rise when we try to speak about the contribution of globalization. The studies by, uh, <coughs> by Muzaffar Asadi or we have A.R. Vasvi's contribution or Vanna Shiva, all of them were emphasizing upon that how the ins, uh, incidence uh, of uh, farmer suicide is higher in the states uh, with the input intensive cash crop cultivation, especially uh, the states like Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka and Kerala, uh, which has shown the high intensive cash crop cultivation say, are under the trap of the suicide. Uh, which is quite visible. So, that way we try to see that uh, uh, these are certain significant things uh, which are basically happening. We also try to see that uh, the number of suicides uh, which has been registered, uh, most of them are basically those who are having the significant lands, uh, people who are uh, the landless, they are basically away from uh, the so called uh, suicidal tendency. So, virtually we can say that uh, once you are into the subs uh, uh, substantial land and you are related with the market to globalization, uh, you have more tendency towards uh, uh, the commitment of suicide. Uh, whereas, the people who are not coming into the picture in terms of having no land, and so their linkage with the market or with the global forces is going to be minimum. So, there I think uh, the, the rate of suicide uh, is comparatively lower. So, that is how we try to see that. Uh, the new form of agrarian crisis is happening when we are moving towards the capitalistic economy in terms of the rural uh, India. We try to find out that uh, in the uh, under the banner of uh, uh, globalization and privatization, we try to see the tyranny of uh, farmer suicide, uh, which is quite visible. And that way, I think uh, we try to see that uh, many issues are coming up, especially the agrarian sub uh, agricultural subsidies, which I shared earlier. Then also we try to see that uh, the decline in the government uh, investment in agricultural sector, I think that is one bigger challenge which uh, the Indian society has to face. And I think uh, beyond that, uh, uh, the share which uh, was there for the public distribution system uh, for the people uh, below the poverty line, 
uh, that also has been drastically changed. So now with the increase in the prices of the food grains, uh, uh, I think uh, many times you find that the ration shops uh, which were seen as the site for uh, the support of uh, to the uh, poor people uh, that also has gone down. And we try to see that uh, uh, these uh, subsidized food uh, uh, grains which were available to the people with the support of the government that has also lessened <laughs> to the drastic level. And so, uh, we try to see that uh, uh, the effect of globalization especially on the poor in general and to the tribals and the, uh, the lower caste Dalits in particular that is going to be more difficult because they are uh, the people who are the victims of uh, the globalization uh, because of this particular issue. I think uh, uh, the whole uh, notion which has been raised, uh, the resistance which has been generated by the uh, Indian, uh, Indian uh, population on the issue of the WTO, I think uh, that is quite visible. Uh, we had uh, the strong resistance which has taken place uh, against the Dunkel proposal, uh, the, the issue of patent uh, which has been a quite a common phenomenon whereby the people they try to resist the issue of w, WTO and uh, how uh, we try to over uh, fight but ultimately we have to succumb to that pressure and the, <coughs> yeah, the Indian nation has to be the signatory body uh, with regard to the GATT general agreement on trade and tariff. So, I think uh, somewhere uh, down the line we have to see that uh, ultimately uh, directly or indirectly we have to be uh, into the, uh, the, the play. Uh, either we withdraw ourselves completely uh, which may not happen when we try to speak about the globalization in general. But what is more important of course is that either we have to be players at the equal fitting and if we want to do that actually we have to really uh, support the whole issue and we have to uh, be active players. So virtually we try to see that the agriculture sector in India uh, which is basically facing the crisis uh, today. Uh, is basically in the name of globalization as a process which started in 1990s and that is leading to many uh, direct and indirect crises in the Indian society. And uh, parallelly I think uh, the role of the state uh, which has shrinked drastically that is going to be another important issue. We try to find out that uh, the people are trying to show the protest and these protests are visible basically uh, through the issues of uh, uh, what you can say the new farmers movement which are seen across the globe and that is how we try to see that the challenges are basically coming up. But uh, more important is that uh, uh, how to overcome these issues and how to minimize the effects of globalization and to make it more productive uh, that is going to be an important issue uh, that basically we have to face uh, to overcome the agrarian crisis uh, which are basically coming up in the countryside. So, the effect of globalization uh, which one can see are going to be significant is basically we have to see that uh, economists are basically trying to speak about that the global ev events connected with the globalization are uh, basically viewed as uh, bringing about the new changes. One positive thing which we can see about globalization uh, in terms of various forces are that improvement in the trade globally. Uh, globally that is going to be an important issue. We try to see that there is standardization of the global practices uh, which has been there. Apart from that there is a progress in the technology in general uh, which is quite visible and we try to see that the new form of technologies are been uh, invented and then even in the agriculture also we try to see that the new technologies are trying to enhance the productivity again going to be very crucial because now these players. Uh, which has never been part and parcel of uh, the countryside. Uh, they are coming into the countryside, they are now going for the corporate farming, they are sometimes uh, having purchasing the lands in bulk in the rural areas and sometimes uh, they are making uh, the use of the resources of the local and trying to uh, uh, <coughs> put that uh, amount or the benefits uh, to the others or to their own sake. So, that is how I think uh, the countryside sometimes are been felt as cheated and the, there is a question of uh, uh, the draining away of the money from the countryside to the uh, worldwide and that of course is quite visible with the advent of the multinational companies in the country. Uh, apart from that I think uh, the power of WTO uh, that is the World Trade Organization or the International Monetary Funds or for that sake the World Bank uh, that has I think uh, drastically increased. 
uh, which has never been uh, there earlier. So, we try to see that uh, uh, the new agencies in terms of the finance, in terms of uh, the, econ uh, the economic organizations, uh, they are coming into the pictures. Uh, so, the power of the WTO, IMF, World Banks and many other international organizations have come into the picture. And apart from that, I think the most significant thing is that the greater mobility of the human resources across the countries has drastically incre uh, uh, increased uh, basically with the advent of uh, globalization. And apart from that, I think uh, greater outsourcing of uh, the business uh, processes has been done uh, globally that of course is uh, the visible outcome. And finally, I think uh, we can say that the role of civil society uh, which can be seen at uh, various levels uh, which are seen as uh, uh, civil societies working uh, abroad, civil societies at the national level, uh, civil society at the uh, regional level or sometimes the civil societies which are working at the local level. So, I think uh, there is mushrooming of the civil societies which are working for the cause of uh, uh, the people at the countryside. Uh, that I think is going to be one beneficial situation which is coming up and uh, we just try to see that uh, uh, the adverse impact of globalization uh, which are to be seen uh, which are going to be just uh, negative for the uh, countryside and which definitely has a long term bearing are basically uh, can be uh, seen in this fashion that first is the decline in the employment opportunities. I think this is one bigger thing because uh, the employment uh, is not simply the, uh, the, the <coughs> putting the manpower into the place, what is required is the skilled people. Uh, so, if you do not have a skill, so you are out of the competition and you are not required uh, in terms of employment. So, I think uh, that is the biggest challenge which is coming up even when there is a industrialization of the agriculture, there also you re require the sophisticated skills and if you are not into that, so you are going to be out of that uh, production system. So, I think uh, somewhere there is a decline in the employability uh, in terms of the skill employment. Also, we try to see that there is an unreasonable price rise uh, and the identical increase in the income uh, which is also uh, visible. Uh, one can say that there is a fluctuation in the price uh, <coughs> which of course is quite uncertain, it is full of risk uh, which is also happening. And also we try to see that there is a slowdown in the decline or decline in the investment in the agriculture by the government uh, which is going to affect the poor, the marginal and the small peasants drastically. And we also try to see uh, another significant shift which has happened uh, because of the globalization on the Indian scenario is the disappearance of the village industries and the crafts, uh, especially we try to speak about the cottage industries, the small scale industries. I think uh, they are gr gradually vanishing because they are not in a position to compete uh, with the outside players. So, that way I think uh, there is a drastic decline in that and also we try to see that there is a reduction of the expenditure of labor and the alternative avenues. So, we have the reduction of the expenditure of labor that is again going to be an important issue because the machines are going to replace the labor. Uh, so, that way I think uh, uh, the expenditure on labor has been drastically reduced. And apart from that, I think uh, we have this whole uh, issue of uh, uh, sort of self-confidence, security and national autonomy. I think that is going to be the biggest threat uh, which is coming up because of globalization. Neither we have the self-confidence because the world is open in terms of security. Uh, I think there are number of challenges which are coming up. We also try to see that our autonomy in terms of the state, in terms of uh, uh, our own uh, uh, what you can say control in terms of uh, the produce, in terms of the subsidies, I think they are going to be challenged by the outside forces. So, national autonomy is at stake. So, that is uh, how I think globalization is going to affect uh, <coughs> the countryside and we have to really see that in order to overcome uh, these issues, I think uh, we have to go for the drastic changes, especially uh, we have to be competitively uh, correct and uh, how we are going to do that, I think that is the biggest challenge because somewhere in many instances uh, we are going to be uh, in the uh, domain of uh, the international market where I think the prices uh, even the labor or in terms of uh, the employment or we try to see in terms of investment all the things are not rested in the hands of uh, a single nation rather it is going to be decided what you have to produce how much you have to how to how much you have to produce what are the how you are going to market it out most of the things are now been directed or are under control 
and that way I think uh, if you try to see that uh, the countries which are uh, having uh, the hegemonic positions especially the developed countries we try to see that uh, they have better control and that is uh, sometimes seen as the new form of uh, imperialism uh, which is coming up and we basically try to see that uh, uh, this new form of imperialism uh, which is called as the new, uh, <coughs> new imperialism is basically leading to another uh, story uh, whereby the country are basically at threat in terms of their autonomy and now they are been regulated or been uh, uh, captured by or been controlled by the external agencies and that is where the problem lies. So, we have to really see that how we are going to overcome these challenges. I think uh, globalization uh, we can always say no to globalization, but at one period of time I think we have to be the uh, we have to accept it uh, because it is going to come up not by choice rather it has to it will be coming by force. So, how we are going to overcome <coughs> that particular issue uh, where it is not going to be seen as uh, a sort of choice it is not something voluntary it is a forceful uh, intrusion into the countryside into the nation and where I think uh, uh, the problem is that how to say no to that uh, is going to be a important question. Further, I think uh, uh, globalization as I said that uh, it is going to be having uh, the drastic implications uh, not to the countryside alone, even the people who are most vulnerable uh, who is going to be the sustainer of that. Basically, when we try to speak about uh, uh, the concern of the state uh, in terms of the wel wel welfare oriented strategies, I think we try to find out that uh, uh, these welfare oriented strategies they are uh, going to be minimized. And uh, now we try to see that subsidized food, subsidized cropping or subsidy in the form of agriculture they are going to be at uh, <coughs> the lesser end and virtually we try to see that uh, now the dictating conditions are been fixed by the private players. And as we know that the uh, private players for them uh, the, the, the goal for them or uh, the, the yield for them is to have more and more profit and that way if you try to see uh, we can just say that. Uh, uh, profit uh, motto is the ultimate, their concern is not for the development of the countryside, their concern is to get the best uh, resources, to get the most production from that and uh, like Vanda Shiva was basically trying to speak about that how the uh, pace of globalization is going to affect the countryside. Uh, like the transnational corporations which are coming into the picture. Now, these transnational corporations their basic business is to have more and more productivity. So, what they are doing of course, is in the rural areas they are trying to have the excessive use of uh, the water uh, in terms of irrigation or maybe uh, having more production uh, which has been seen as uh, the diverse form of hybridity. So, the nature the natural uh, concern of the crop that is going to be disturbed and that is how we try to see that uh, these are the new challenges which are coming up. We try to see that uh, uh, the, the countryside which were seen as the abundant source of resources in terms of the natural resources I think uh, they are going to be I think uh, drastically challenged. There is now the crisis of uh, the food in terms of food virginity. Uh, we try to see the crisis in terms of uh, uh, the food crops. Also we try to see that uh, there is also the concern for uh, what you can say the starvation in terms of uh, the food and along with that uh, the most important thing is that we try to see that uh, the environment is going to be drastically affected. Now, the, the, the issue of water the depletion of land in terms of its value overuse of the land in terms of excessive fertilizer or polluting the uh, <coughs> countryside I think is going to be the biggest threat uh, which is happening because of the globalization. We also try to see that uh, along with these things uh, uh, other important things which are happening are that uh, we try to find out that uh, in the name of globalization uh, the cash crops are going to be uh, the important source of uh, uh, earning and that way I think uh, there is a crisis of the uh, food crops. Uh, so, there is a shortage of the food crops so our dependency has to be more on the other countries for getting the food crops that is going to be the another biggest challenge. So, it is going to distort the the agrarian structure uh, or the countryside in general and which will lead to the uh, new formation the new social formations like 
uh, we will have the new classes uh, which will emerge because the producers are not the producers which are from the countryside, the producers are or the investor, investors are the people who are from outside and how they are going to play or how they are going to work for uh, their own benefits. So, I think uh, we have to see and that is why Vanda Shiva sometimes is trying to see in terms of uh, uh, the new challenges which are coming up because of globalization, because it is affecting the sustainability of the, the countryside and that of course is going to be the biggest challenge, because it is not only affecting it economically, it is also affecting it uh, culturally and also it is going to affect uh, environmentally. So, the question of sustainability, sustainability of culture, the sustainability of values, the sustainability of uh, the environment, I think uh, these are the bigger questions uh, which are to be addressed and they are the sensitive uh, issues uh, beyond what farmer societies we are dis discussing about. So, it is basically seen as a threat uh, to the life, it is seen as a threat to the nature, it is basically seen as a threat uh, to one's livelihood. So, I think if we are in a position to overcome these crises, especially uh, in the field of countryside, then we can say that we can have uh, the brighter side of the globalization. So, I think the beyond these challenges, uh, we have to really see what are the strategies which we have to devise as I have discussed earlier also. So, I think uh, somewhere if we try to see these things, uh, we can have a better solution to the advent of globalization on the agriculture. And I think uh, wonderful works are been there. Basically, we have uh, the contribution by uh, M. Muzaffar Asadi, uh, which we discussed earlier also in terms of farmer suicide. We have also G. S. Bhalla's contribution in the form of globalization and Indian agriculture. Uh, we can also speak about uh, the contribution of uh, uh, the various contribution by Abhijit Sen in terms of economic liberalization and agriculture in India. And along with that, uh, Gorang Sai's contribution in terms of global labor uh, <coughs> university conference paper on uh, globalization, liberalization and agrarian distress. And I think uh, Vanda Shiva's contribution, how green is the green revolution and many significant uh, challenges which has been posed by her are going to be quite significant. So, friends, I think uh, this is what uh, we have to see and uh, it is an ongoing story. So, many more things can be added and your uh, wisdom with regard to this whole issue can make this more uh, clear and also it can also make it more wonderful uh, with the new uh, things which are coming up because of globalization. I think we have to see these uh, challenges and also we have to overcome them. So, this is all about uh, what we have to say when we try to speak about the issue of globalization and agriculture. So, thank you for your patient listenings and I think uh, wonderful queries and discussions can be made on this particular issue. So, thank you to all of you. Uh, for this wonderful deliberations and interaction. Thank you to all of you.